So as we go into the mid 20th century, this is about the time that computers are arriving. So the uh, famous computer science researcher, theoretician, um, Turing created a theoretical model for a machine that could calculate outputs from inputs. Basically, um, he didn't really quite invent the idea of a computer, but he really, um, he really, uh, uh, I guess, hammered out exactly how one would work. He also proved that a single such machine, some pure machine, a single one called a universal Turing machine, could in theory carry out any algorithm that is calculable. So he proved that mathematically. Um, basically, if something can just like take in inputs and outputs, if we can do it like a reading and a writing operation like modern computers obviously do, uh, then it can carry out any algorithm. Basically, anything that's computable could be done on this one machine. And sure enough, within 20 years, we had uh, Newell and Simon publishing a, a really famous paper showing that they'd created a computer program that was able to prove mathematical theorems, to make new proofs of mathematical theorems. So people were kind of freaking out at the time because they're like, this is weird. The idea of a thinking computer, as they talked about, uh, what we're talking about is a machine that thinks, a machine that seems to do what human minds do. And that's obviously really interesting. So the first binary computer, I mean, they, that came about around the time Turing was first talking about this stuff. But even with the, just, within just a few years, by, by around the 1940s, we had pretty much a modern form of what computers are like today. So some sort of central processing unit to manipulate information that comes in through input. Today, input would be like a keyboard or a mouse and goes to some sort of output. That would be like the screen you're looking at or a file that gets saved. But also there's memory like, like RAM in a modern computer, something where um, information is sort of temporarily stored while it's being used and secondary storage for more like long-term memory, as it were. So the point is we, we get these flow charts basically documenting, understanding how computers work, how computers process information. We can trace the flow of information as it gets processed. And people, as they understood um, how these computers work, started wondering, well, does that mean the brain does that? Is that basically what a brain is? Is it possible to say that the brain is really just a computer? And so this led to what we'll call the information, information processing approach to studying cognition. This really is where we start getting the birth of cognitive psychology. So in the last slide, we had that, that flow chart of information from an input to an output and what's happening in between the input and the output. We had that for a computer. And around the middle of the last century, you start seeing people, start seeing psychologists trying to work out that same thing, but for the human mind. So how we take inputs, things that we might um, hear or see or feel, so information stimuli from the world, how that might uh, process information in our brains or in, within, within ourselves, process that information, make changes or calculations or cognitive operations, and lead to some responses, some behaviors we do out there in the world. Um, so we'll come back, we'll talk about Broadbent's model and, and um, more specifically, more recent models that talk about how memory might work, how attention might work. We'll get into those in detail later in the semester. But I just wanted to give you an idea what I'm talking about when we, when we say that people start to have or to use an information processing approach to studying cognition. That's what we're talking about. Looking at our thinking uh, similar to how computers think or how computers process information. So cognitive psychology is, is really coming about around this time, just looking at studying our mental processes, looking at studying psychology, but the, the processes that are involved, the specifics and things like perception and attention and learning and memory and language and all the stuff we'll be talking about this semester um, and explicitly ap applying that information processing approach to it. So if uh, the behaviorists like B.F. Skinner um, or at least the radical behaviorists were arguing that what happens in our minds, the mental stuff is a sort of black box that we can never objectively measure. They're arguing we should stick to just the input and the output. The cognitive psychology approach says, no, we can absolutely find clever ways to measure what's going on inside, to get objective scientific information, scientific data about how the information gets processed, how the input gets turned into an output. 
And so even by the, the mid-1960s, uh, cognitive psychology had become um, a, a, a field that was starting to really take off. There was a cognitive psychology textbook, and pretty soon after, cognitive psychology became one of the most, um, or one of the standard courses in, in any psychology department as it is today. So an information processing model, what we're talking about is instead of just thinking like a um, behaviorist might and, and talk about Oh, the stimulus is someone seeing, you know, the equation 7x plus 1 equals 29. That's a stimulus in the environment. And then saying, well, let's look at what behavior they give when we show that equation to them visually. Well, their behavior might be saying 4 out loud or pressing 4 on a keyboard. That's like all a behaviorist has to work with is put the stimulus in front of people and see what behavior they give. And you can try and reward them over time and build up to where they can uh, do better, get faster at giving a particular behavior when a particular stimuli, like a particular equation, is in front of them. But cognitive psychology, using the information processing approach, says no, we can develop models, we can collect data, we can try and figure out what's going on between point A and point B. Um, so ignore the specific times on the left here. We'll come back to that in class and talk about um, how we might trace the, the specific time when certain cognitive operations are happening. But the idea here on this slide is just that we can create some sort of model of how people solve an equation like this. So some of it might be visually retrieving information, looking at, at certain parts of the equation at a particular time, and then uh, retrieving from memory particular cognitive operations, like what is subtraction versus plus, or uh, what is 29 minus one, like remembering what that is, being able to retrieve that it is 28. Um, remembering what 28 divided by 7 is. So that just might be retrieving things from memory or doing uh, other cognitive operations. And then eventually that gets us to the, the response, the output, the, the motor response of moving your hand to press 4 on a keyboard or moving your, your lips to say 4 out loud. So if cognitive psychology is talking about the brain kind of like a computer, what they're really saying is that that cognition, our thought, our intelligent behavior is in essence basically just responding appropriately to input by doing some sort of internal manipulation of information, internal uh, manipulation of symbolic representations, we might say, of the world. So what do I mean by representations? Well, think about this. If I ask you, what is two squared? Probably you can, you can say that that's four. If I ask you, what is 278 squared? you might not have an answer memorized for that. You might not have a representation of what 278 squared is. You might have a representation of 278 or what it is to square something, but you don't necessarily have a representation of 278 squared. Same way you do is two squared. I could ask you, who is this person? And assuming you watch movies and, and you know, know who this is, you probably can answer out loud, oh, that's, that's Robert De Niro. Or I could ask you, well, write down how to get from, say, Tin Barrel to the Boise Zoo. Uh, and assuming that you know those places, you've been downtown in Boise, um, maybe you could draw me a map or describe it out loud or gesticulate with your arms. Um, but you could retrieve some information that's stored in your brain that allows you to answer that question. So instead of just looking at the input and the output like behaviorists, a cognitive psychologist says, no, some sort of process is going on when I ask you that first bit, that what is two squared, you have to first off have a representation of what two is. You need to understand what two is. You need to have a concept of two, some representation. And then of course there's cognitive operations like squaring it, you know, being able to represent what that is. Same thing with recognizing the face. Before you can say out loud and verbalize, oh, that the name is Robert De Niro, you first have to have that that face itself stored in memory in some way that is represented, maybe in this case represented in neurons in your brain, but have some representation of that face and then have that connected to other information, other representations like the name. So you have to do this extra operation like retrieving the name that goes along with that face, the name that is associated with that face, which is weird when you think about it, right? We're talking about sounds that are associated with sights. So we have two different pieces of information that the brain has previously through previous experience connected and those are sort of um, we, we can kind of look at 
how different information is represented. We'll get into that later in the semester, but that's how we get to the step of being able to actually answer a, a simple question like, oh, that's Robert De Niro. I have recognized him. Now, I could show a different picture like this, and though it might not be as accurate, uh, most people can still, even with the high frequency information removed, can still recognize and say, oh, I think that's Abraham Lincoln. Um, or likewise, these weird caricatures here, um, most people could probably identify from this if you're familiar with American politics, at least, uh, or American history. You know, Bill Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton, George Bush, and Albert Einstein down there at the bottom. Why, why do these caricatures matter? Why am I bringing this up? Because it's kind of weird and interesting that we are able to recognize those people, who those um, people are that are being represented here, from pictures we've never seen and pictures that are in fact pretty darn inaccurate. These pictures are not anything like what the person really looks like. I mean, it's, it's pretty different in a lot of ways than the person's actual face. So how is it that our brain is still able to retrieve the correct name, retrieve the, the correct associations with it? Why is it important to, to cognitive psychologists that we can still recognize those pictures? or different angles of the same person, maybe even angles that I've never seen that person from before. It's, it, it, it shows us something interesting. It shows us that representations, so information stored in the brain, representations have like just enough information stored to recognize or make use of it based on just a few features. Representations are selective and they are not accurate. They're at least not perfectly accurate reproductions of the world. Sort of like, as we'll see when we talk about memory, our memory does not work. Even our like visual memory does not work like a photograph. We don't store all of the details of what we've seen or what we've done or what we've heard. We store just the gist of things, just the, the broad strokes outlines, and we, we leave a lot of information off the table and never store that at all. We represent only uh, some aspects of the world out there. And that's what it is to, to use and, and um, manipulate information is to be selective about things. And that does mean we'll introduce errors. So cognitive psychologists are interested in how that works. So bringing us back to that big, big picture question, is the brain a computer? Um, people will still debate this, sort of both sides of this today. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which the brain is similar to a computer, and certainly we can name some ways that it's not identical to, to modern digital computers. Um, but but kind of why this is interesting big picture, well, that Turing guy that I talked about before, he also proved mathematically that a computer could theoretically be made out of anything. A, a computer could be made out of beer cups and ping pong balls. A computer could be made out of toilet paper and ink. People have actually made computers purely just out of Legos with no electronic components at all. But those computers could prove, because they are computers, they're uni universal Turing machines, they could prove mathematical theorems, they could do any computation, they could carry out any algorithm, they could run Call of Duty, uh, obviously be, have, to, have to be hooked up to a monitor in the right way, but they could do all of the things that a modern digital computer can even if it's made of beer cups and ping pong balls or whatever substrate we choose. And what that means is, what we learn from these proofs is, the specific type of hardware isn't really essential to being able to, to do cognitive processes, to be able to process information. We can compute using sort of any hardware, really, if it's set up in the right way. Computers can come in many form, forms, so it's, it's actually pretty um, plausible to say that networks of neurons could be doing computing. Networks of neurons could be computers, that a brain could be a computer. Um, the, the most common way of, of, of putting this as sort of making an analogy between the brain and a computer would be that our uh, central nervous system and some of the peripheral nervous system, like the sensory systems and the brain itself are kind of the hardware they act really, the, the neural networks act as sort of a parallel computer. And then the mental stuff, the mind, that is to say the, the cognition, the thoughts that we have, that's more like analogous to software, to like programs that are running, basically algorithms that are processing information. So it gets carried out on networks of neurons, but the cognition stuff is 
what's going on in those networks of neurons. It's the particular programs that are being instantiated in that, that hardware. So if the cognition or the, the mind, if we will, is really just kind of information processing, if it's just processing inputs and outputs, regardless of what it's built out of, then that also brings up the, the big question, well, okay, if, if our brain is a computer and we're thinking and, and have cognition, we have thoughts and feelings and consciousness, does that mean that machines can think? Can machines, something made out of just silicone chips, like can, can, uh, can a, a digital computer like those today or a quantum computer of the next you know 20 years, can those think? Can they have the same experiences, maybe even the same consciousness that we do? And that's really where we get the birth of the field artificial intelligence. Um, it's, it's under what we call sort of the umbrella field of cognitive science, where you find artificial intelligence, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, uh, philosophy of mind, and some related fields like linguistics. These are all under the, the overarching um, field of cognitive science because we're interested in a lot of the same things. So artificial intelligence is really coming out, or the debates about artificial intelligence are really coming out of the same debates that cognitive psychologists are having about how the brain and the mind works or how the brain leads to a mind happening. Uh, and this also is uh, part of a bigger picture question, which is like, does the body itself even matter all that much to cognition? If you've seen the movie The Matrix, you're probably familiar with this idea of maybe we're just living in a simulated world. Maybe if we stimulate that computer, our brain, if we stimulate the neural network in the right way, we could have totally realistic experiences. Everything, all the conversations we're having and the things we're seeing and feeling, those could all just be simulated, even if they're not really happening to us in the world. Um, and this, this isn't brand new to the matrix. It actually came out of a long history of thought experiments and philosophy, um, what used to be called the brain in the vat problem, uh, but started actually with that guy Descartes, his idea of an evil demon, this idea that all of our sensory experiences can be doubted because they could just be um, tricks by some evil demon that is putting these sensory experiences in, in front of us, that is making us experience things even if the world out there doesn't match that. That's what led to him doubting his senses and, and starting from scratch and starting from rationalism thinking, oh, well, I, I think, therefore I know I at least exist. I know I am. Um, so this is, as we'll see, it's going to be relevant to an area I, I won't talk about a lot today, but in the future of, in this class, we'll talk about embodied cognition, the role that our body has and its interaction with the world, um, the role that has to our thinking and our cognition. But a lot of these um, debates really came from this understanding from Turing and people like that, that, well, computers can, can be instantiated on anything. Maybe the underlying substrate doesn't matter. So maybe, uh, you know, not only can computers perhaps think, but maybe thinking can happen even if there's no body or brain at all. Uh, or maybe a brain could be uploaded into a computer and we could have the same experiences and cognition and consciousness. Um, if we're on a computer, even without a body, these are all sort of questions that though they're obviously weird and abstract at this point, um, we might run into in a few of the readings later in the semester. All right. So that was uh, a lot of stuff really quick, but just to sum up, to put this all together so far, people have been thinking and arguing about the mind. So about, you know, our psychology or our cognition uh, for a long time. And really we can, we can say historically there have been sort of two general approaches um, that have sometimes been in contrast. One is starting from observable things, sort of collecting data, getting out in the world, getting your hands dirty. And that would be like empiricism in philosophy. Um, obviously all the physiology, the, the anatomy side of things, uh, and then experimental psychology and the behaviorism that came out of that. And on the other side, we have the approach of starting from inner mental experience, like the rationalist philosophy, the introspection that early psychologists and some on one side did and phenomenology. And what the cognitive revolution really did, if we step back and think about it, uh, the cognitive revolution was trying to say we can use these empirical and experimental methods, that, that first side of things, to study inner mental experiences. 
In other words, we can find objective ways to study what's going on in people's conscious experience, to what's going on in our minds when we think. So the information processing approach is, is probably the biggest part of this in the cognitive revolution. The idea that the brain is at least analogous in some way to a computer, that it's an information processing device of some sort. Uh, and really we could say the mind, our mental experience is kind of a process. It's like the software. Um, being a minder, minding is, is what the brain does. Uh, and uh, I guess a, a side effect of this or, or something that's been the case for at least a long time with cognitive psychology is that cognition has been treated largely as a disembodied thing, as like disembodied just processing of internal symbolic representations. Like I said, that processing could occur in neurons firing, like in our brains, but it could just as easily, the same thinking could be done by beer cups manipulated in the right way or by a computer doing a matrix simulation. So the point is, for a long time, cognitive psychology hasn't cared about the specifics of the body or, or even how it's particularly laid out in the brain, but really just interested in the how information is uh, represented and manipulated in that system. Um, but we will talk a, a lot about this uh, newer field of embodied cognition and how that sort of uh, adds some nuance and updates things. So just to end, we could, we could say all these historical and modern approaches to studying cognition, even though I've kind of put some of them as like A versus B, um, historically like they're sort of opposites, really they may be complementary. Certainly the, the back and forth and the debates have helped drive forward the way we understand things today, our understanding of, of cognition. So you can see how cognitive psychology comes out of those earlier streams of thought, but also interacts with things like artificial intelligence, our understanding of computers today, the neuroscience that's going on today, and um, like embodied cognition and some other newer areas. So we'll stop there. I hope that gave a decent overview of where cognitive psychology came from. Like I said, I know this stuff early in a semester is often really boring, but hopefully it helps set the context when we discuss some of these things uh, later on in the semester.